Hey guys, check out this piece of redwood that we just finished coating using stone coat countertop epoxy. We're gonna show you in this video how to use casting resin to do an amazing river of epoxy with all these deep effects. We're gonna show you how to clear coat it using stone coat countertop products. We're gonna show you how to set this up, all the tips and tricks right now, and visit our site anytime at stonecoatcountertops.com. Enjoy the video. All right, we're gonna take this piece of redwood and we're gonna turn this into an amazing table. Right now, it's a smaller piece of redwood. It's about 23 inches on the, on the wide end and it's about 19 inches on the short end. And we're gonna add some width to this and we're gonna make a river of epoxy, just a, a really neat element, an artistic element to this piece of wood. It really brings in you know, nature into a modern element. It, it's gonna look fantastic. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut this piece of redwood right down the center. So I'll make a couple center marks. We're gonna uh, give ourselves a straight line and then we'll take our skill saw and just cut right through this piece of wood so that we can now flip it into itself and the live edges become your, uh, your template for your river. Here we go. <laughs> You know, we do a lot of wood slab work and we, we get some really neat pieces of wood to, to turn into furniture and things like that. And this, this little piece of redwood is a perfect example of something that's just too small for a dining table or a desk or something like that. And, and it could be used for other things, but you can always get artistic and change something or make it more functional by doing some different things. And epoxy is the medium that bridges that gap. It really gives us an opportunity to make this thing one of a kind. Uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna really have a good time with this. I got that center line drawn in. Uh, we're gonna cut this right now and, and then you'll see what, what takes place. This is gonna be a fun project. All right, we got these redwood pieces cut and flipped. I really like how this river is going to look through here. What we're going to do now is we're going to transfer these pieces onto our, our bar table. We're actually going to flip it upside down and we're going to install reinforcement bars. These reinforcement bars will actually hold this steady and hold it true and make it very, very structural and sound as we pour our epoxy. The epoxy is very strong, but we like insurance. So we're gonna put bars. These are three quarter by three quarter square tubing. And so on our router bit, we're gonna use a seven eighths inch router bit. I'll show you that right now. So our router bit is a seven eighths inch router bit, which gives us a 16th on each side of our bar. And because we're going to bondo these in the underside of our redwood, we need a little bit of space for that bondo. So we're gonna go um, uh, seven eighths wide on our router for a three quarter inch square tube. And then we're also going to go below the surface so that when we bondo these, we can keep it flush with the surface. All right, let's go ahead and flip these. We'll show you what we're talking about right now. Uh, this is also real important when you're doing any wood slab. You're gonna have cracks and, and, and weak points and places that that slab wants to come apart. If you put uh, your square tubes underneath your slab, it does a couple of things. Whenever you slab a piece of round wood or a tree, it wants to cup and bow on you. This is your prevention. Uh, you can go ahead and spend hours getting this flat and perfect and, 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 uh, and put our stone coat countertop epoxy on it, but you want it to stay put. And so you put these bars underneath, whether you're doing this method or whether you're doing a normal wood slab, and that's going to keep it true and flat. If you don't do something like this, you're gonna find that that wood will still move over time and uh, you'll, be, you'll be disappointed. So use this trick, you'll love it. All right, Mitch and I are gonna flip this over here. That piece will go there. And we'll take care of the underside. We'll flatten everything after, after we're said and done here, but our top is flat, so let's go ahead and get these bars set. We're gonna lay this out. So what are we on this end, Mitch? 23 and a half. So yeah, we got 23 and a half where we're gonna butt these tight, and so we're gonna do the same thing down here. I'm happy right there. Okay, double check that, 
perfect. Let's go ahead, you wanna clamp that side, I'll clamp the other side. So we're just clamping these to our, our base here so that they don't move as we're routering in our bars. All right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this three quarter inch square tubing and you can see these natural fissures and cracks here in our redwood. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just use my scrap piece of three quarter inch plywood as a straight edge. I'll screw this in temporarily so my router can ride this edge to create our, our joint here. But I wanna make sure that I don't go too far so I'm gonna give myself a couple of reference lines of where that bar needs to be. As you can see, I've set that bar in from the edge so that obviously we don't wanna protrude and see a bar on the, on the, on the uh, exterior edge of our table. All right, one question is, where are we gonna lay these bars out? Do we get them perfectly um, centered off of each other? In this case, we won't, and I'll tell you why. We're only looking for the cracks and, and the weak points of this wood, and we'll, we'll put our bars across those points. Um, if you were to see these through a clear river of epoxy, then we would get these bars perfectly centered. But because we're going to color it with our metallic additives, you're never gonna see the bars. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and put some marks here where these bars are so I don't go too far when I'm routering this out. So as you can see, the bars are gonna fit just beautifully in there. When we bondo those in, it will all be encapsulated and it's gonna hold this uh, strong as an ox. All right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna mix up enough Bondo to start putting these bars in, and I'll show you how we do that. It's, it's real simple. You're just gonna take some of our Bondo. We're gonna put this right here. I'm gonna mix it directly on my wood slab here. You can use a paper plate. You can use whatever you'd like, but we're gonna grind this bottom and, and sand and, and clean up this bottom anyhow. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use it as a mixing surface. Whenever you're working with the all-purpose Bondo putty, you wanna make sure uh, you don't get the kind that has fiberglass strands in it. We don't really like that stuff. It doesn't do good on our rock face edge. And, and we like to carry products that we can use in uh, multi-facets. So we're gonna use this in putting our bars in. We use it on the rock face edge and we use it in other aspects of installing and fabricating stone coat countertops. But in this case, we love this product, but you don't wanna add too much hardener and you don't wanna do too, too much mix uh, that you can't handle, especially on a hot day. If you do too much, it's gonna set off pretty fast. So we're gonna work a couple bars at a time. We'll get these set and we'll move on right down the line here. So I'm just gonna add some of my hardener here. You can see it's not a critical measurement. Um, it says 2% by volume typically, but I've worked with this a lot. That's how much we're gonna use. I'm just gonna take our spatula here and just start mixing this together. It's important that it's mixed up correctly and. Um, you wanna mix it thoroughly. So we just use the spreader here, mix it up, and then I like to back butter the, uh, the notch here where our bars are gonna go. I'll back butter that a little bit and then we'll start uh, putting, putting in our bars. And as you can see on the bars, I've, I've roughed those up with a, uh, my angle grinder that we use to get off drips and things like that that you see in our other videos. I just rough that up with a 50 grit metal sanding disc. And that cleans the bar as well as creates uh, sanding scratches as like a mechanical bond. So you can see I'm just back buttering a little bit in there and as I force this bar in, it's going to ooze out all the way around that bar. Ah, there we go. And then I'm just gonna take some of this and I'm just gonna go right over that bar. And it's really that simple. It's a great technique to give you great rigidity in your wood slab projects and not fear that when you ship these across the country that they're gonna come apart. Hey, while I'm here, might as well just get these cracks and crevices here too, right? We'll do that. All right, so I got that one done. It's oozed out exactly how I need it to underneath there. We're gonna mix up some more, let's do it. All right, what's really cool about doing these slabs this way is when we had this flipped upside down on our table, you can see that it's kept everything in plane. So this is really flat across our surface 
And when we router those bars in, because we did it upside down on a flat table, after we've cut this, it keeps everything really flat and makes it possible to make this very level. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip my slab over. We're going to use HVAC tape or that metal foil tape that's really sticky and we're going to create a dam underneath our, our slab here so that when we pour our stone coat countertop casting epoxy it won't flow out. The, the tape will hold it and it'll keep it nice and strong for us. I'll go ahead and flip this. That's what's nice about using these bars is it's just made this very strong, very rigid, and I know it's going to stay put. So we'll go ahead and get that tape. We'll put it on here and show you the next step. All right, guys, what we're going to do now is we're going to get our, our void here taped off so that we can flip this over and pour this. Uh, we have metal HVAC tape. This is just really sticky metal foil tape, and that's what's going to keep us from leaking. So here we go. Let's, let's go ahead and tape this off. Okay, we've got our whole piece taped off here. You want to make sure you really iron that tape on so we don't have any leaks and un unexpected uh-ohs. Uh <laughs> so go ahead and tape that all off. Get it ready for your next step. We've uh, taped the sides off. Now we're going to flip it over and tape the sides all the way up to the top so we can fill this up. Here we go. Let's do that. All right, guys, we're ready for the fun part. What we're going to do now is we're going to add our stone coat countertop casting resin. This is what's going to create our river. We're going to do this entire piece with our colors. We're going to do a base of ocean blue as the, as the base of, of this color. And then we're going to introduce accents of tropical turquoise. We're going to do bright silver. And we're also going to do blue earth. And we're going to bring all those pieces together to meld and, and, and flow. And it's going to be a very natural beautiful effect to this uh, organic redwood. Uh, let's see how it turns out. But keep in mind, when you're going to work with our casting epoxy, this is the product that you will mix with a stick. We don't want to entrain too much air. All right, when you're using our casting epoxy, you have to keep in mind that you can do up to one inch at a time if you're going to keep it crystal clear. And then you'll let that dry, you'll lightly sand it, and you'll do another inch. We're going to do one quarter inch at a time, torch it, and work our way up up to one inch. So now, when you're mixing the stone coat countertop casting resin, it's a two to one ratio. That's two parts A to one part B. We like to uh, use a, a mixing bucket with, with dimensions on the side. It's very important. Don't guess and don't use um, a tape measure to figure out where it is. Use a bucket that's graduated and has the, uh, has the mixing dimensions right there on the side. What we're going to do is we're going to mix this clear and we'll mix it with a stir stick. We'll mix it for about three minutes and then we're going to add our ocean blue. Uh, we're going to set a little bit aside so that we can make different colors and different accents, but the majority of it is going to be mixed with ocean blue. Uh, also, when you're mixing, you're going to want to scrape the bottom of the bucket. You're going to want to scrape the sides of the bucket. You don't want any sticky spots appearing, so that's why you want to get every every bit just scraped and, and mixed. And it's crazy, you can already see straight through this. It's very, very clear. We love working with our casting epoxy. It's really neat, just make sure that you do it a little bit at a time, making sure to pop all those bubbles. That's really the most important thing to remember. Mix thoroughly, get that bottom of the bucket, make sure to scrape those sides really, really well. Use our measuring bucket and you're gonna be in good shape. It's gonna come out with some amazing projects. This, I'm so excited for this table. We've been waiting a little bit to do this one and I can't wait for you guys to see how cool this can be. All right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add this ocean blue. Let's go ahead and get that mixed in. You wanna make sure to mix this really thoroughly. Um, you don't want them to leave little pockets of uh, metallic pigment in there, so make sure that you continue to stir. You've got plenty of working time with this, so just keep, keep on stirring. Uh, make sure that you are patient with it and that you're going to get the color and the desires and the, the style that you're really looking for. 
Also, the scary part's coming up. When you start pouring this into your mold here, you really hope that tape holds. You don't want, you don't want to have done a, a bad job using that tape to stick it to the bottom. That's why you want to use that HVAC tape. Uh, don't use duct tape or you know, masking tape or anything like that. It won't, it, won't, it won't create a really good seal for you. All right, you ready? Yeah. All right, let's, let's pour this in. So when you pour this in, you really want to let the material do, do the job for you. You don't want to just force it in, just kind of let it flow in there. I'll show you how. Like me to start mixing that other stuff while you're doing this one? Um, sure. Oh, yeah, look at that color. Boy, that does look like a river, doesn't it? Yeah, it's so cool. I was looking at uh, the brackets here that we have for support and how it kind of created that dam effect. It's kind of cool. Look at it going over. That's cool. I know. Guys, sorry about that. Our battery cut out on us. What we did here is we actually sealed these knots. We went through and took our Bondo spreader and we sealed our knots so they'll get some of that color in them as well. And now we're going to add our different colors. We filled this all the way up. We're going to add our different colors and we're going to put some contrasting color and we might even put some spray paint in this. We'll see what it looks like. Right now I'm just mixing up some clear uh, casting resin and I'll uh, separate it equally into these three cups so we can make our accent colors. I just love the way this ocean blue reacts. I mean it just does its own thing in there. It's beautiful. I really really like how this is going to look. It will look cool just with this color but we're going to take it to the next level. All right let's go ahead and mix up a few cups here. Remember when you're working with this material, you're going to make a mess. So, so mask off your areas, you know, understand that you're going to make a mess, get ready for that and be prepared and you'll have a great time. What color is that? Man? This is blue earth and then I'm going to do a tropical turquoise and I'm going to do a bright silver. And then we're going to see what it looks like, make more decisions after that. Catherine, which one do you want to start with? Oh, I don't know. Go for it. I think I like this bright silver. Let's, right. let's see what it looks like here. All right, let's do some of this tropical turquoise. Oh, that's going to be really cool. And then finally the blue earth. All right. Let's use our stir stick and mix that in there and see what happens here. Oh, goodness. Look at that. And all I'm doing here is just mixing these around. And this is making just beautiful art here for us. I love the way that mixing these metallics just creates something outstanding. It takes no skill. You just move it around and look at that. Now what we've done is we've, we've just created an art piece and when you go to, 
to sell your tables or use these or give them away as a as a gift. Uh, anybody who sees this is just gonna just gonna be blown away at the artistic element in this. Look at that. I love those colors. Spreading out ones that look a little funky to me, but man, this is just turning out gorgeous. Hey guys, we let this set up overnight. It's nice and hard and we're ready for our next step. What we're going to do is we're going to sand all the excess casting epoxy off of the surface. Hey guys, we're going to show you something really exciting that we've been working on with our slab jig. And this jig is made uh, our, our surfacing and our planing and our flattening of our solid wood slabs just a breeze. It, it has really been an improvement on our wood jig and I'm going to show you how this works. This is very, very rigid right here in the center of the jig. Uh, it's hard to get rigidity when you're building these out of wood. It's also hard to get them to roll really, really smooth and not bind up. And so we've done that with this jig and it's also completely adjustable to whatever router base we're using and it's also adjustable this way so we can do jumbo slabs. Currently we have it set up for our 4x8 sheet of plywood so it'll ride a 4x8 sheet of plywood but it can be adjusted and, and you can extend your table if you have a 50 inch slab you can do that you can do uh, you know even bigger than that you can go big jumbo slabs down to a small slab all done on a standard 4x8 sheet of plywood also we have very rigid rails here that we're sliding on and all of our chips get spit out it's just just a joy to work with we have a full 3 inch surface planing bit in this router and this this bit just eats this slab up and it makes it flat very quickly and we're going to show you right here on camera how we get all of our gunk and goo right off this slab and then we'll start our sanding process. Uh, I just want to tell you this thing has helped our lives. If you're in the wood slab business you go, you're going to want this jig. You can find it anytime at stonecoatcountertops.com. Check it out. All right let's go for it. So you can see the quick work that this jig makes of flattening this slab out. We are just getting in here and, and getting all, we're, we're actually taking off about a sixteenth of material. We're getting right through that epoxy. It cleans this up really well and then we'll start to sand all that out. But this is just a joy to work with. Let's go ahead and, and finish this up and then our epoxy is going to be perfectly flat with our surface. So when we do our flood coats, we'll have just, just no problems at all. You won't see a dip or anything like that. Let's keep this up. Okay, we got our uh, surface all planed down with our, with our jig, and now we're going to take our 50 grit metal fiber sanding disc, and we're going to go ahead and get rid of all of our marks from the surface planing bit, and uh, we'll get ready for our next step. So let's go ahead and make short work of this with that 50 grit metal sanding disc. OK, 
Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to take our belt sander and we're going to remove some of these um, circular scratch marks and go vertical with the grain with our belt sander and then we'll start with our random orbital. Here we go. All right, what we got here is a 60 grit sanding disc on our random orbital. We're going to go through here and sand all those uh, belt sander scratches out now. All right guys, time to seal coat this thing. What we're gonna do when we seal coat is we're gonna use one ounce per square foot. On a piece of redwood or oak or poplar or, or, or dark walnut, we usually do three to four seal coats. We use one ounce per square foot. If you try to go too thick on your first coats, you'll get air that comes up that you just can't get rid of. And so we start with thin coats and then we do one flood coat at the end. So we're gonna go ahead and squeegee these out one ounce per square foot. Let's get started. You're going to see this sucker come to life. I'll get a paint stick and scoop that out. Okay. All right, let's mix that together a little bit. Oh, look at that. Look at that come to life. Holy cow, this is gorgeous. This is just beautiful. You know, once you sand that river and sand that epoxy, it doles out, and then you do this, and goodness, look at it just come back to life. I love the white that we did on the edges. I love the different colors mixed in there, and, and uh, wow, I'm just very, very happy with this. Now you can see I'm just using just a normal squeegee that you can get for cleaning showers and stuff like that. We like all plastic ones. We don't like metal on them just in case you wear out the squeegee portion. You want to, uh, you want to make sure that you don't scratch your, your uh, wood up and stuff like that. So the all plastic ones like insurance. Wow, look at this. What do you guys think? It's amazing. It's so fun to do this. You really just, it's what, a, what, a, what an amazing career. I love working with wood slabs and countertops and I love the epoxy and the effects that you can get. There's just nothing like it, guys. All right, let's go ahead and do this part. Very, very cool. On the seal coats, I like to do the edges with my hand. You don't need to waste a brush on your edges. And you can see how one ounce per square foot, it just is enough to get the product, get the uh, table wet, and that's what I'm going for. and you can watch those air bubbles just shoot right to the surface. What do you think of this river? That river is something else. And when I'm torching, I'm acting like I'm mowing the lawn. So I'll start on one side, go front to back, and over, overlap the flame as I'm working my way down. And you can see that flame hit the epoxy, and the air bubbles just run right out of there. Man, that vein is something else. <laughs> You know, it's really important to keep in mind when you're doing a project like this, when you do your seal coats, it's gonna be bumpy. You're gonna have, you're gonna have little nibs and nubs from where it's sealing. It's gonna saturate. Some areas worse than others. Uh, some, some's gonna look dry. That's normal. You're gonna do this three times and then we're gonna flood coat it. And when you hit that flood coat, that's when, uh, that's when it magically is, is finally finished. Oh, I like this. I like the different colors in there. guys, our seal coat is dry. We're going to sand it to get ready for our next seal coat. And all we're going to use is 220 grit and just come in here and rough it up. So all we're doing is just scratching it, getting, ready, getting rid of any little nibs and nubs that we don't like. And I have some 
high and low points and there's some points that look dry, that's all normal. That's what you get in the seal coat. So we're going to go ahead and sand this up and do another seal coat right now. Here we go. Okay guys, we're going to sand this second seal coat and we're going to do a third seal coat. So we'll just sand this with 220 grit. You can use anything between 150 and 220, it's just fine. We'll mix up another one ounce per square foot. We'll spread it with a squeegee and let it dry. Here we go. All right, we've done our third seal coat. Uh, what, what's really cool about doing your seal coats is you see the piece progressively get better and better. Your first seal coat, you're gonna have imperfections, you'll have dry spots, the wood will soak in the uh, epoxy at different rates and you'll think you've done something wrong. You haven't, you're just doing the process of sealing the wood. Uh, this, this is almost perfect. I'm very thin, so I still have imperfections and I got ripples and things like that, but I'm not seeing the, the voids and the pits, especially around the knots and stuff, that's where you get air bubbles that want to continually come up. And if we did a flood coat, that would be uh, a problem because you wouldn't get those bubbles sanded out. Because we've gone so thin, you just sand everything in between coats and it hides all those imperfections. This is how you get wood slab tops to look professional. That's how we do it. We'll see you at the flood coat. Okay guys, we got our third and final seal coat finished on this particular table. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my burn-in stick and I'm going to heat it up and I'm going to fill just a couple of these little stubborn pinholes that just don't seem to go away. And inevitably, you're going to find these on a wood project where a knot is or a crack. It just seems like it's a never-ending epoxy drainer. You know, it just wants to go down in that little hole or it wants to repel that epoxy. We're going to fill these with the burn-in stick and then we'll use our straight edge uh, razor blade and we'll scrape off the excess, sand it, and we're ready for our flood coat. And then you don't have these stubborn areas giving you fits anymore. And now after our third seal coat, we have just one little stubborn area here and one here. It'll take us just a few moments to fix it. Let's show you how that works. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to sand that area a little bit just so we get some good bite, some good mechanical bond. <sighs> sand that one. And I got one here. Let's sand that area. <sighs> and let's go ahead and fill these. So I'm going to take my torch, let's get that lit up. I'm going to take my burn-in stick, I'll heat it up, and I'm just going to color that in. That's all I need there, heat that up, and we'll color that in. Okay, and that will solve my problem. I'm going to take my straight edge razor blade, I'm going to keep it at a 90 degree angle to the surface, and I'm just going to scrape off the excess. And that won't really show up as a repair, you won't see where I did that, it's just such a, and you can get those burning sticks from Mohawk, we have a link to those on our site. And those just are a lifesaver when it comes to stubborn little fills like that. Now we've got all those scratches and that's okay. We're going to sand this and we're ready for our final flood coat. So just as normal, you're just going to go through here and sand this up. So you create again that mechanical bond. We've let this dry overnight. It's nice and dry. We've got a few areas that are still kind of bumpy and we sand those smooth. Be careful not to go through what you've already done, you know, on those edges and stuff. But now that we got those nice and smooth, it's going to uh, help us have that flood coat go out like glass. And that's how you get real perfect finishes. You want to sand all the little nibs and nubs off these edges. Doesn't need to be perfect, but you'll feel them with your hand. They'll be kind of, kind of nubby and just a couple passes with that sandpaper and all of a sudden it'll be nice and smooth and, and ready for that final coat. Some real porous wood, you may need to do four seal coats. Heck, you may even do five seal coats, but the seal coats don't require a lot of material and they really help you out to prep for that final flood coat. 
And that flood coat, you don't want to do it when you have pinholes that are stubborn and not going away unless you've filled them up or else they're going to come back again on that flood coat and you'll have used a lot of material and have to do another coat to hide that pinhole. So remedy those pinholes now and you'll thank me later. All right. All right, we're going to wipe off the dust and we'll be ready. Here we go. Okay, we got our stone coat countertop epoxy mixed up, ready for our flood coat. On this coat, we're going to use three ounces per square foot. So we have about a 12 square foot table. You'll use 36 ounces. That would be 18 ounces of part A and 18 ounces of part B. Let's go. We'll pour this out. We'll use our paint stick. We'll scrape out the excess right into the mass. And then we'll remix it on the table with our trowel as well as our brush. We'll trowel this out and then we'll torch it. Okay, let's mix up that excess that we just put in there that we scraped in so that gets nice and mixed. Now we're just gonna start troweling this out. We don't go all the way to the edges quite yet. We're simply gonna get the material out close to the edge and then we'll come dress our edges up. So I'm just moving this out here, getting it close to the edge, and then I'll push it over the edges after I've done the entire surface. All right, now I'm just pushing it over those edges so I have enough to coat my edges. Come over here so I can see what I'm doing. You notice I keep my trowel over my piece so you don't get drips everywhere where you don't want them. Right. And the 1 8 inch square notch trowel, it really gauges this at the pro proper height for you so you know you're not wasting material, but you know you're not leave leaving it too thin where it won't level for you. This, this takes a lot of the guesswork out of it, makes it very simple. Now I just mowed the lawn so that I, I know I have it all even out there. Now I'm going to chop it. So when we chop our material, I like to prime my brush so I don't pull the material away from where I start chopping it. So I'll prime it here. Now I'm just gonna start chopping this. And what this is doing is it's getting rid of any of my marks that I could have left from the trowel. And it's also remixing this material right here on the surface. And you wanna make sure you go all the way to the edges and overlap those edges when you do this because it will force material over your edges but it will break any surface tension. Surface tension likes to kinda create itself and come apparent at those edges. And if you break that, it'll flow over your edges very, very well. And I know we're putting bubbles and we're kind of making the surface uneven, but because we have a nice even coat, it just levels out very, very well for us. So I'm just going down the line here. I'm gonna do this and, and chop this uh, out and then I'll come and I will brush our edges and, and and those uh, will have drips and stuff coming down right now and brushing those edges is going to make them um, very smooth. And we'll do this a couple of times on the edges as well because as we torch this and material goes over the edge, you want to finish with those edges to get them real smooth. I got this little torch here at Harbor Freight. It's a lot cheaper than a Burns-O-Matic torch. Um, the igniter doesn't work very well. It works okay, but I just got one of these little welding igniters and, and that lights it right up for me. So this is a, a great torch. If you don't want to spend a bunch of money on a Burns-O-Matic, you can get a cheaper one at Harbor Freight. Just make sure the torch you get has holes here towards the base where it meets your nozzle because then you can hold it upside down without your torch going out. And that's popping those bubbles just beautifully. You gotta make sure you torch your piece at least three times. You don't wanna leave your torch in one spot a long time. I'm just sweeping the surface here and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this all torched out. Now's a good time to look for any loose bristles that may have gotten in your surface. That's uh, real important to get those out now and then uh, we're gonna keep the air movement off these pieces. You don't want fans and heating and air vents and uh, dryer ducts from 
uh, like lint uh, from a dryer, anything like that going on in the space where this is going to cure. You're going to want it nice and still and nice and warm um, so that it will dry properly and, and nice and hard. And, and you want to keep that going for, for a few days while it's uh, curing. After, after it's set up, after about 12 hours, you don't have to worry about the dust, but you still want to keep your room warm so that it cures properly. Hey guys, we got our final coat down on this project. Not only is this a wood slab project, this is an art project. I am thrilled with this metallic hand in hand with this redwood. It has just come out gorgeous. Uh, I can't get over it. Hey, uh, a couple of tips and tricks I want to go over before we wrap this up. When working with our casting resin, remember, don't pour more than one inch at a time. And as you're pouring that inch, every quarter inch, get in there and torch it so you can build those layers up and pour an, another quarter inch right on top of that immediately up to one inch at a time. If your project is deeper than an inch, wait till the next day, sand it, and repeat that process till you fill your project. You always want to cover our casting epoxy with our normal stone coat countertop epoxy. That's where the heat resistance, the scratch resistance, and the durability is found. Uh, when doing a project like this, take your time. Make sure where you've, where you've got the piece uh, on your table, it's flat, it's formed up where you can't get any leaks. If you need to, where those cracks and crevices are, you can use uh, modeling clay, you can use Bondo, you can use anything to seal between your table and that tape so that you ensure that you don't get leaks as you're filling it with casting resin. You could always then flip the piece and any voids from that clay, you can pull the clay out and the tape and fill it from the bottom side if you so de uh, desire. Um, Okay, other tips and tricks. Make sure that you torch your, your project on the final flood coat three times. That will ensure that you don't get those divots. Sometimes people will just torch it one time, but there's still air trying to escape. Come back and torch it three times. Brush your edges horizontally, and that gives you really clean, crisp edges. Uh, and take your time and have a good time when you're doing this project. It is, it is so much fun and those seal coats are key without doing a flood coat first and trapping all that air in. Let this slab off gas, get all that air out, and you're gonna have a flood coat that's completely flawless. I have no pinholes that are leaking air. Those two problem areas were very evident after the third seal coat. Uh, give us a call anytime with questions. We're happy to walk you through your wood slab projects. If you're looking into getting into wood slabs as a side business, Give us a call. We'll steer you in the right direction. Uh, feel free to visit our website anytime at StoneCoatCountertops.com. And remember, until next time from Stonecoat Countertops, you got this. All right, we'll see you later.